have in Tom Graves, one of the most respected conservatives on Capitol Hill. It is great to be in Dalton. Thank you all for coming out. Karen and I are thrilled to be with all of you today. It just was a few short weeks ago, it seems, that I got a phone call late at night to the governor's residence in Indianapolis with my wife and my son. And I heard that familiar voice come across the line. And he said, Mike, it's going to be great. And he invited me not just to run, but to serve as the next Vice President of the United States of America. And I couldn't be more humbled. And I couldn't be more honored. Because i got to tell you, I joined this campaign in a heartbeat. Because you have nominated a man for president who never quits. He's a winner. He's a fighter. He can give as good as he gets. And he's going to fight his way all the way to the Oval Office. And we're going to make Donald Trump the next president of the United States of America. You know, I appreciated that introduction that, uh, that Tom shared with you a few minutes ago. And he's a dear friend. I, I can say I was, for, I was for Tom Graves before it was cool. I really was, but it was exciting to see him arrive in the Congress in 2010 and to see his, his uh, career emerge and his great family. But he knows the introduction I prefer is just a little bit shorter, and that is, uh, I'm a Christian, a conservative, and a Republican in that order. And it's just wonderful to be with you, wonderful to be with you in Georgia to tell the story of this running mate of mine. And to lay out a vision and lay out this choice. And then I'm, I'm really looking forward to getting to your questions and to hear what's on your mind. But, uh, but thank you all for being here. I, I know I'm kind of a B-list Republican celebrity. So to see this kind of a turnout says what Donald Trump always says to me. We talked earlier this morning. We talked just about every day, sometimes a couple times a day. And I want to assure you that Donald Trump understands this is not about a man. This is not about a team. This is not even about a political party. This is a movement of the American people that will make America great again. And I'm honored. I'm honored you'd be here with us to stand in that movement today. You know, sometimes people ask me, what is it about Donald Trump? Since I've had a chance to get to know him over the last couple of months. And I know, you know, I'm from south of Highway 40 in Indiana, so we speak pretty plainly. And I just tell people, you know, Donald Trump gets it. You know what I mean? He understands and hears the hopes and aspirations and the frustrations of the American people more clearly than any leader in my party since Ronald Reagan. I truly believe that. I mean, he's a genuine article, isn't he? And he's a, he's a distinctly American leader. Right? Speaks his mind. Straight at you. Shoots straight from the hip. And I'll tell you what, when he does his talking, he doesn't go tiptoeing around those thousands of rules of political correctness that the media and the political class puts in the way of men and women that want to make a difference. He says it like it is, and the American people hear him loud and clear. And i got to tell you, up close and personal, it's kind of fun to watch. <laughs> it really is sometimes, because, you know, I just think, you know, the, the party in power seems helpless to figure out our nominee. And, of course, I'm talking about the media. I mean, think about it. I mean, <laughs> I mean the, the, media, the media and the Democrats all have the same problem. They, they keep telling each other the usual methods of them, right? Now we got that word he used. We got that tweet he sent. They think they, think they finally done him in. We got him this time. Then they turn on the television the next morning, and Donald Trump is still standing stronger than ever before and fighting for the American people. It really is amazing if you think about it. At the very moment that the American people, Republicans, Independents, and Democrats are crying out for something new and different, the other party has answered with a stale agenda and the most predictable of names. I mean, people in this, 
country, both parties are restless for change. We know things can be better. We know America can be stronger. And yet the other party nominated someone who literally represents everything this country is tired of. So why don't we just decide right here in Dalton, Georgia? We're going to do everything in our power to ensure that Hillary Clinton never becomes president of the United States of America. Can we do that? Let's just make a decision. I mean, I truly do believe. I mean, it's, it's hard to keep up with all the reasons why we've got to make sure that happens. I mean, really, truly. I mean, uh, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm, I'm, I'm starting to experience what I'll call Clinton controversy fatigue. Any of the rest of you get that? I mean, I'm, I'm like open up every morning and here's more emails she didn't turn over showing more stuff about the relationship. I mean, I, I got to tell you, it's, but, the, but the media is so busy parsing everything that Donald Trump said or tweeted in the last three days that they don't have any time to talk about what the Clintons have been up to the last 30 years. But we're going to correct that in the next 70 days. I mean, the cascade of controversies, I mean, you know, a couple weeks ago we found out new emails came to life that show a so a relationship between donors, foreign donors, to the Clinton Foundation and special access to the State Department. I mean, the FBI wanted to look into it and open up a public corruption case. We were told they got shut down a while back. A couple days ago, we found out that 85 of the 154 meetings that Secretary of State Hillary Clinton granted in her four years to individuals when she was Secretary of State were given to people that had contributed tens of millions of dollars to her foundation. And on and on it goes, and the, the Clinton's response to all of this is they, they've announced that if she's elected President of the United States of America, they'll, they'll unwind their relationship to the Clinton Foundation. So they're, they're acknowledging a conflict of interest if she was President, but doesn't that mean there was also a conflict of interest in accepting foreign donor contributions when she was Secretary of State? You know, you know the American people are sick and tired. Sick and tired of pay to play politics, and it's exactly the kind of politics that's going to come to a crashing halt the day that Donald Trump becomes President of the United States of America. When Donald Trump becomes president, I'm here to tell you, the rigged system for the favored few in Washington, D.C. is over. Donald Trump's only special interest will be you, the American people, and he'll fight for you and for your agenda each and every day. But beyond all of that, it's important that we talk about the record of the last seven and a half years because the American people have a choice to make. We've got to take a clear-eyed look. I mean, Hillary Clinton is literally, literally campaigning to, for um, Barack Obama's third term. And your supporters boast about that. So we need to talk about that right now. Because I would submit to you today that seven and a half years of Barack Obama and Hillary Clinton's leadership has weakened America's place in the world and stifled America's economy. Seven and a half years of Hillary Clinton Barack Obama's brand of leadership on the world stage has, uh, has resulted in, in, in a decline in American influence in the world. And each and every day, it seems like we open up the newspaper and another part of the world seems to be spinning out of control, doesn't it? I mean, we've got terrorist attacks inspired at home against our allies abroad, grim and heartbreaking scenes in our allies where lives are claimed and lost, attempted coups. You know, history teaches that weakness arouses evil. And I would submit to you that the Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama's foreign policy of leading from behind, moving red lines, feigning resets with Russia, and paying ransom to terrorist-sponsoring states has weakened America's place in the world. Let me be clear. Let me make you a promise. When Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America, we won't be paying ransom to terror-sponsoring states. They'll be paying a price. 
if they threaten or detain American citizens or our allies. You've got to be clear on this, uh, folks, with your neighbors and friends. I mean, it was, it was Hillary Clinton, the Secretary of State, that actually initiated that disastrous agreement with the radical mullahs in Iran. It was uh, Hillary Clinton and Barack Obama who compromised the, the hard-fought gains in Operation Iraqi Freedom, precipitously withdrawing American forces out of Iraq after that country had become stable because of the sacrifices of our soldiers in uniform. Before I go one step further, can I ask those who wore the uniform of the United States of America to either stand if you are able or raise your hands so that we might say to each and every one of you one more time how grateful we are for your service to this nation. of the United States of America. I mean, I mean, you know, we cannot have four more years apologizing to our enemies and abandoning our friends. America needs to be strong for the world to be safe. And I want to promise you, on the first day of this administration, Donald Trump will rebuild our military, restore the arsenal of democracy, support our troops at home and abroad, and Donald Trump will lead with American strength on the world stage, and the world will be safer as a result. But then we look at that record abroad, and we also got to talk about the record here at home because it's just as bad. I mean, we are in the midst, my friends here in Georgia were actually, despite all the rosy speeches that they made at their convention, we're in the midst of the weakest economic recovery since the Great Depression. I mean, I don't know if you got a chance to see their convention speech. I was able to watch most of it. I mean, I had as hard a time staying awake as her husband did. Be with you. But it wasn't, it wasn't that it was long, it was, it was late, but nobody knew there. There were many new. It was the same old, same old. The same policies that resulted in the lowest labor participation rates since the 1970s. And 7 million more Americans living in poverty today than the day that Barack Obama became president of the United States. Hillary Clinton's answers raised taxes by $1.3 trillion, increased spending by more than a trillion dollars in one speech alone, and more Obamacare, more of the war on coal. When she was asked how she was, asked how she was going to pay for all the new spending, over a trillion dollars in new spending, she actually said in a speech a little while back, I'm going to tell you how we're going to pay for it. We're going to go where the money is. We're going after the super wealthy. We're going after corporations. We're going after Wall Street. Well, she certainly, certainly knows where all those things are. <laughs> and we're in front of all that spending. Margaret Thatcher probably said it best. 
She said, the problem with socialism is you eventually run out of other people's money. I mean, folks, I mean, they tell us this is the best we can do, right? This economy is the best we can do. But I think you know here in Georgia, Tom Gray's country, this is nowhere near the best that we can do. This is just the best they can do. And when Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America, we're going to get this economy moving for every American in every community in every state in this nation. Donald Trump has a plan. I was there for her. I introduced him. I'm going to be in Arizona with him tomorrow when he's talking immigration, but I was in Detroit when he was talking economic growth. He's a hard man to precede. <laughs> I'll do my best tomorrow. But Donald Trump laid out a plan. I encourage you to go look at it. Talk to your neighbors and friends about it. It's a time-honored principle of how we get this economy moving again through tax reform, regulatory reform, trade reform, and energy reform. Donald Trump becomes president of the United States of America. We're going to work with great conservatives like Tom Grace. And right out of the gate, we're going to lower taxes across the board for working families, small businesses, and family farms. We're going to end death taxes once and for all. And we're going to lower the taxes on American businesses in Dalton, Georgia, so we can compete and keep jobs here with companies that are going to take them around the world. And in uh, regulatory reform on day one, Donald Trump's going to sign a moratorium on new federal regulation and red tape, and he's going to repeal every one of those Obama executive orders that are stifling jobs in this country. And I promise you, Donald Trump and I did coal. And we're going to end the war on coal on the first day of the Trump administration. And we're going to let the American people develop the natural resources of this nation to support a growing economy. And lastly, and lastly, as we prepare to elect one of the most successful business leaders in the free world, as our new negotiator in chief, we're going to have a president who rolls his sleeves up and make sure that when we engage in trade with countries around the world, that our trade deals work for American workers here in Georgia, support American jobs and exports, and we hold our trading partners accountable to the commitments that they make to open their markets to American goods. You know, Hillary Clinton, there's a lot of economists that said that's going to result in some really good things in our economy. Hillary Clinton the other day said that projections that Donald Trump's plan will get the economy moving again were, quote, wildly unrealistic. That was her word. Well, Donald Trump and I believe the only thing wildly unrealistic is electing the same people with the same bad ideas and expecting a different result. Donald Trump's going to bring time-honored ideas to a growing American economy, and just like they've worked every time before, they're going to release the boundless potential of the American economy once again. Now I'm going to get to your questions, but I have one more issue I want to make sure you all talk about with your neighbors and friends. And that is, as this election approaches, we need to remind ourselves that while we're electing a president for the next four years, that president will very likely determine the course and destiny of the Supreme Court of the United States for the next 40 years. We're going to think about that. If you cherish your Constitution, if you cherish the liberties enshrined there, like the Second Amendment to the Constitution of the United States of America, you to think hard about it. So I would say to all of you, for the sake of the rule of law, for the sake of the sanctity of life, for the sake of that Second Amendment and the right to keep and bear arms, and the sake of all of our God-given liberties, let's just decide right here and now in Dalton, Georgia, that the next president to make appointments to the Supreme Court of the United States of America will be President Donald Trump. It matters. 
Now, I'm here, I'm here to, to answer some of your questions and chat with you a little bit, but I'm, I'm going to leave you with one admonition if I can, and that is, I want you to go tell somebody, okay? I mean, uh, the road to the White House, uh, the road to the White House is going to go straight through Georgia. And some people are talking about Georgia going the other way this year. But so we need you to we need you to be out there. I tell you the enthusiasm that I encountered in the southern part of the state in Atlanta last night and here with all of you gives me great confidence that we're gonna put Georgia in the column for Donald Trump and you're gonna be on the winning side on November the eighth. But you gotta go tell somebody. You gotta go tell somebody. If you've heard me talk about something today, whether it's uh, you know the cascade of controversies, <laughs> and I left a lot out. <laughs> whether it's the really, really enormous issues of America's place in the world and our strength at home for the Supreme Court, I want you to go tell somebody because I promise you that all the TV shows in the world, all the newspaper headlines in America, all the tweets and the websites combined. Don't matter a fraction of what you pulling aside a neighbor or a friend or a coworker at work or at worship and just saying, let me tell you why this election is important. Let me tell you why Donald Trump has to be the next president of the United States. So I want you to go tell somebody. And I want you to reach out. But I want you to reach out with one other message. You know, it's, we live in a very challenging time in the life of this nation. There seem to be so many things that divide us, so few great purposes that unite us the way they once did. But it doesn't have to be that way. I mean, I, I was raised, I was raised really sitting on a footstool in front of the American dream. In many ways, Donald Trump and I have a similar background. Our grandfathers both immigrated to this country. Our fathers were both self-made men. We were both raised to believe that to do much is given, much will be required. And so we build on what we've been given. And other than a whole bunch of zeros, we really have a lot in common. I mean, a bunch of zeros. But the truth of the matter is, we both, we both grew up, and when I'm around Donald Trump and all the Cleveland lights are on, I can tell you that what drives him it's not just the choice between change and the status quo. It's not just the choice that we face of whether we're going to continue to head down to a weaker America at home and abroad and changing, a changing interpretation of our constitutional liberties or head back up toward the low star of a strong America and greater freedom. It's, but it kind of what comes out of him when you're around is a boundless confidence and faith in the American people. And it derives from how his family has been blessed. And that's where it comes from with me. And so I hope as you go out and you talk to neighbors and friends, you'll talk about the choice. But I also hope you'll talk about the belief that in Donald Trump, we're going to have a president of the United States who will look for those ideals and principles that will unite us. And chief among them is the American dream and opening that dream for every American, regardless of race or creed or color. We're going to drive hard. That's what making America great again means. To make America great again is to, is to open the doorway to the American dream for every American. And the last thing I ask you just personally is I go to your questions that I hope if you're inclined as Karen and I are, and I know it's a great family, do from time to time. If you occasionally bend the knee, I encourage you to do that. Because I still believe what has been true for millennia is still true today. That if his people who are called by his name will humble themselves and pray, He'll hear from heaven again, and he'll heal our land. He'll do it. So, so we've got a very clear choice, very clear choice to make, and I'll lay it out for you, and then I'll jump to your questions. If you want a president who will protect this nation, rebuild our military, secure our borders, enforce 
our laws of this country and confront the enemies of our freedom and security at home and abroad. If you want a president who will restore law and order to every city and every community and will stand without apology for the men and women who wear the uniform of law enforcement in Georgia and all across the United States of America. If, if you want a president, if you want a president who will cut taxes, grow the economy, squeeze every nickel out of that bloated federal bureaucracy, and repeal Obamacare lock, stock, and barrel, and if you want a president, if you want a president who will upend the status quo in Washington, D.C., and uphold the Constitution of the United States of America, then I want to tell you, Dalton, I want to tell you, Georgia, you have only one choice if you want all those things. And I'm here to tell you, that man is ready. This team is ready. This movement is ready. Let's go make sure that Georgia is ready, and we will make Donald Trump the 45th president of the United States of America, and he will make America great again. I promise you that. I, do, I really do believe that it's important for us to pay more attention to what we already know. Seventy days to go. And I hope you took my admonition to heart that we, uh, we got to tell somebody about this. But slip your hand in the air if you got a question or you got a thought. And I'm happy to call on you. Why don't you slide right back there, gentlemen, against the back wall. Tell me your first name if you're fine. Uh, Governor, my name is Norman. Uh, will the Trump Pence administration take care of veterans who are taking global war terrorism for the last 15 years? We've got to take care of them. They've lost limbs and they're getting the best prosthetics they can get, but that's a permanent loss, sir. And they've got to be permanently taken care of. Thank you. Thank you. Who were you with? Who were you with in the service? Air Force now, sir. Air Force. Thanks. Norman, uh, Norman, thank you for your service. Uh, thank you for your service. And thank you for being a passionate advocate for those who serve. I want to promise you, it was the first speech that I attended with Donald Trump. It was at the National Convention for the VFW. And I'm going to tell you what, go check that speech out. Because Donald Trump laid out a, a bristling agenda, a CEO's agenda, and Donald Trump has a plan to get the Veterans Health Administration working to provide world-class health care to everyone who has served in the uniform of the United States of America. We're going to do it. We're going to do it. And, and he, I'm telling you what, he gets very passionate about this stuff. He affectionately refers to the vets, you've heard him say. Right? He's passionate, uh, like, like, like almost no other issue. Because we've seen these headlines, these heartbreaking headlines of people having to wait for weeks and in some cases months for medical treatment. You know, Donald Trump and I both know and understand. We're, we're, not, we're not talking about entitlements for veterans. We're talking about we're talking about benefits that you earned when you put on the uniform of the United States, and we see it no other way. Okay? And the commitment is this. We're going to get the Veterans Health Administration working, providing world-class health care, and if a veteran can't get services in real time, we're going to make it possible for them to go across the street and get private health care at taxpayer support. It's just going to happen. But take a look at that speech, Norman. Thank you. Thank you very much. It's an honor. How about this lady right over here? Yes, please. What's your name? Susan. Hi, Susan. There's the mic. I first am very honored that you are here in Georgia talking with us. I'm honored. I'm very humbled. Thank you. I am so concerned and in disillusioned with the blatant corruption that is just before us. And, and I think we all continuously hear about voter fraud. Right. And 
and I think that's a great fear that I have that regardless of how many people come out and support the, the Trump-Pence ticket, that perhaps this is rigged. I mean, what would stop them? Right. Well, well, number one, one thank you. you. Thanks, Thanks for your kindness to me and my family. family. We're honored and humbled to be here. here. Uh, and to see so many good people of Georgia come out. This is uh, very meaningful to us. Um, look, I, I, I would tell you, I think your skepticism is well founded, but the response ought to be action. I said this in Atlanta last night, and that you know, I've only had three elective offices, I'm applying for a fourth. Uh, uh, but one was governor of the state that I love. Um, the other was I was a member of Congress for 12 years. And the other was I was a precinct committee. Okay. And, and, and I'll tell you what, um, that, that for those of you that are in this movement, those of you that are inspired to, to be out here on, on an afternoon to hear from the likes of me, I hope that that will translate and you knocking on some doors and making some telephone calls and talking to your neighbors and friends, but I also hope that it will mean that you will get involved in the electoral process in your precinct and in your community. I mean, the one person, one vote principle is the essence of the American democracy. And understanding the anxiety that people feel with the FBI announced yesterday a couple of, a couple of states had obviously been, had apparently been hacked. And uh, we're actually making inquiries in the state of Indiana in our information technology systems uh, to determine whether or not there's any issues related to that to our voter files. And every state should do that. But at the end of the day, remember, these elections happen precinct by precinct. And there's, there's historic and accountable structures that have been in place where it takes people to be in place, people to volunteer time, people to be there and make sure that we, that we protect the vote. That people like Norman put on the uniform so we can have this democracy. But this is the integrity of this democracy we need to be willing to dedicate our time and our energies in the administration of elections. And in the state of Indiana and in states around the country, I'll tell you what, one of the ways that we can do that is what we've done is voter ID. If you're required to have a picture ID to cash a check at a grocery store, you ought to be required to have a picture ID to cash a vote. And it's worked in Indiana, the Supreme Court has reviewed it, it doesn't represent a barrier in any way to people voting. And, uh, but those kind of reforms are important. But I really want to challenge you, and I said this, because I understand the anxiety about the rigged system. My roommate has expressed that concern as well. And it, it can be founded, because there have been instances of voter fraud in my state in the last 10 years, there have been instances in states around the country, but the best safeguard is you. Get involved in your local election, be a poll watcher, be a poll worker, and you'll have to administer elections in Georgia to have real integrity. Hi, how about this guy right here? Hi, what's your name? Hey, my name is McCray. Hey, McCray, thanks, thanks for coming down here. We really appreciate it. Um, nice to well, Thank you. What do you think about the claims made by several doctors, including Dr. Ben Carson and Dr. Drew off of CNN, and other professionals concerning Hillary Clinton's deteriorating health and judgment ability? Do you agree with the 59% of Americans that think she should release her medical records? Well, you know, I, I, I don't want to stipulate, you know, that, that's something that the two major candidates are about the process of doing, and the American people have a right to know that information. But uh, I'm less concerned about her bad health as I am about her bad ideas. She's got a lot of them. Got a lot of them. I mean, you just heard me. I just like gave you the Cliff Notes version here. Am I with you? I mean, that's the stuff that keeps me up at night. I mean, she wants to raise taxes in this economy. I hope you all caught that. I didn't go by it. I mean, by over a trillion dollars, she wants to raise taxes. She thinks Obamacare is just a good start. Right? I mean, it's, it's the bad ideas that we're going to keep focused. But the public always has a right to know. Okay. How about uh, this? Let me go back here. I got a guy in the cat back there. Got time for a few more here, Bobby. I think we're good. Governor Pence, I too would like to say we appreciate, we appreciate you stopping here to visit with us. Thank you. It's an honor. My name is Gary. I live in Rome, Georgia, just nearby. Hey, Gary. Uh, for the last several decades, we have been trying, the American people have, trying our dead level best to stop the Clintons ever since he was governor in Arkansas. 
They are crooked, no question. They have beat us out of millions and millions of dollars. There's no telling what all they have done. But it seems like we can't stop them. They, every time we turn around, we're hearing more about emails and blah, 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 all the time. But what good does it do? Can you stop these people or not? You just watch. You just watch. And the short answer is, you know, it's, uh, I know we, we turn on the TV sometimes, sometimes and you see all these elites and all these talking heads on there all the time and they're going for This country belongs to the American people. And the American people are going to make that choice. And I'll tell you what, that I guarantee you, you're, you uh, Donald, Donald Trump's, Trump's in California, California today, and I'm here in Georgia, and I'll be, before I go to bed tonight, I'll be in North Carolina and in Florida. And I just promise you, we are going to continue in the next 70 days to work our hearts out to take this message to make America great again to every American, every community, every state, and we're going to go earn it, and we're going to see you in the winter circle. Let me see. All right, let's see. Anybody else here? Yeah. Good, good, good. How about, let's, I heard somebody yelling. How about, how about right down here in the corner? Hi, what's your name? Hi. Hi, Governor. My name is Angela York. I live here in Dalton. I just wanted to say Andy? thank you for coming. We're honored. And right. thank you for answering that call. Thank you. Because we need him. We need thank him. You. We need you. Thank you. You're very kind. You're very kind. How about right here in the line? Well, he was first. <laughs> <laughs> you can go ahead. Yeah, uh, my name is Scooter, and I drove up from Atlanta. I heard you on the uh, Miss Kane show. Uh, Governor, I have two questions. That Herman Kane. That correct? Yeah, yeah. Yes. I have two. My mother told me to respect my elders. Be nice. Yeah. <laughs> Two questions, but they surround one thing called immigration. Yes, ma'am. And I'm, re and I don't know why everyone is saying that the illegals. There's 11 million, 11 million, 11 million. When in actuality, there are probably more than 35 million in this country. And the reason I say that, and I have the facts to back it up, is my sister works for the social services here in Georgia. And she says when she goes into a home where there is a anchor baby, a baby born to two illegals, that there are at least a minimum of three to a maximum of seven in the house who are illegal, who are not being reported. And she said to me, what do you think, did, did somebody say, okay, all the illegals stand up and raise your hand so we can count you? The reason now that we're saying there's 11 million is because they've either been incarcerated or they're living off the government, getting some kind of aid, or getting in the hospital, so we know those people. So uh, the first part of the question was, why are we only saying when there's 11 when there's actually 34 million? And I believe if anyone can heal this immigration problem, it's Mr. Trump, because he has whatever it takes for everybody to get out of his way. Uh, And, and my, the, the main part of the question is I've been studying immigration coming from a long line of military family. And I think when our founding fathers created the Constitution and the amendments, that they thought really, really hard about what was bringing this country together and what would separate it. And I do not think that they would have created a law that said, come one, come all, any way you can get into this country illegally, have a baby, and we're going to make everybody a happy family. 
The 14th Amendment specifically says that a child born to two naturalized citizens, not to illegals, becomes a citizen. And for those who don't know what a naturalized citizen is, if you have a great-grandparent that came across, they became naturalized into this country, and by the time it got to the second, third, and fourth generation, you actually are a citizen of the United States. So I, I heard Mr. Trump one time say, we need to fix this at the root and quit putting the Band-Aid on the immigration issue. Because if you bring it back to the 14th Amendment like it is written, we don't have the carrot out bringing the illegals in. So are y'all going to do anything about that? Is she with you? She's not with you. Okay. <laughs> well, well, thank you very much uh, for that question. And let me just let me just speak to it. Get ready for a speech tomorrow night. Okay. It's going to be six o'clock Arizona time. I'm going to fly out tomorrow to catch up with Donald Trump. Donald Trump put the issue of illegal immigration back in the center of the national debate, and he is going to lead an administration that will end illegal immigration in America and fix this broken immigration system. It's going to happen. It's going to happen. I don't want to pre. I don't want to preempt the speech. He and I talked a little bit about it, so I don't want to get too far ahead of him. But uh, wait about 24 hours, you're going to hear a lot of detail. But it's, we just have to simply understand that that while while Donald Trump is committed uh, to to ending the flood of illegal immigration that has been uh, uh, costing jobs uh, for working Americans and those who are here legally beyond our citizens, uh, it has suppressed wages. Uh, in communities around the country, uh, and on occasion, uh, too often, uh, to name, it's, it's resulting in tragedy. Uh, I was with Sarah Root's family in Iowa a few weeks ago, a young girl, my daughter's age, she graduated, literally, highest honors from college and then lost her life uh, to uh, an illegal immigrant in a drunk driving accident who was able then to get out of jail and now he's vanished and he's escaped justice. So we're going to solve this issue. I promise you, uh, Donald Trump is committed uh, to enforcing the laws of this country, upholding the Constitution, securing our borders, including building a wall. You're going to hear all about that again tomorrow, okay? It's coming. But the larger question... The larger question to me here is the contrast between the two. I did a little television show this weekend, and we talked about this. And as much as people want to talk about, well, what about this aspect and that aspect of Donald Trump's plan, the contrast between what Donald Trump is talking about, which is ending illegal immigration and fixing a broken system, and Hillary Clinton, who is for open borders, for amnesty, I mean, literally has said that even though the Supreme Court rejected executive amnesty in this administration, uh, she intends to re-implement it, to re-implement it through, through, uh, in the first hundred days of her administration. She actually, beyond the whole issue of illegal immigration, Hillary Clinton wants to increase the Syrian refugee program by 550%. And so the contrast between someone who is going to secure our borders, enforce our laws, and Donald Trump and fix this broken system, versus Hillary Clinton, who is, continues to be for open borders, for amnesty, and for everything that has brought us to the place we are today could not be more dramatic. So just stay tuned, be ready. Tomorrow night, 6 o'clock Arizona time. I don't know what time that is, Eastern. Is it 9 or 8 or something? Yeah. Don't miss it. Okay. It's going to be a very important address, but I promise you, Donald Trump, what did you say? I just love that. He's got that quality that gets people to get out of the way. I'm telling you what. You know what that quality is? Leadership. And he's going to lead America back, particularly on this issue. How about, Bobby, you got one more one? Okay, Bobby, you got one more for me? All right. You pick. How about, how about the lady in the back? Is that good? Oh, get the little guy. I like 
the little guy. Go with the little guy. What's your name, son? Charlie. Charlie, how are you doing? I'm doing good. <laughs> um, I'm in fourth grade, and what would you do to make my generation be ready for the real world? I think what I, what I would do is elect you a president. I want to elect you a president who, um, who will get us back to what I often tell fourth graders. See, in Indiana, in fourth grade is when we learned about Indiana history. And so I visit a lot of fourth grade classes in Indiana. It's actually a lot of fun. But Charlie, what I want to tell fourth graders a lot of times is I've got a big secret about America, so I'm going to share it with you, okay? And that is that what's been special about America, what's been special about America now for all of our history, is that here in America, anybody can be anybody. That's what the American dream really is, Charlie. It's if you work hard, you study hard, you stay away from things that can destroy your dreams, like drugs and alcohol. And you listen to your parents, you listen to your teachers, the people that love you. The sky's the limit. I mean, Charlie, it wasn't long for me that I was in the fourth grade. Okay, yeah, I was. But I mean, the truth is that I, I grew up like you. I had a point field in my backyard, a little small house. I, I didn't come from any you know, family that had been involved in government and everything. I just had this dream. I was inspired by Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. and President John F. Kennedy and other heroes. And I just said, you know what? I, I think I want to see if I can make a difference in my country. I can pursue my dreams. So I studied hard. I married well. Okay. Thank you for that. Very true. And I went after it. So what I would say to you is that what I'm going to work my heart out to do in the next 70 days, I'm going to uh, do everything in my power, and a lot of these other people are, is to give me a president that believes as passionately in that American dream as I do, and it's going to give you a country where everyone knows in their heart of hearts that this is, uh, this is a place where dreams come true, and the American dream is going to be open to every American, including you, Charlie. So God bless you, buddy. God bless you. Thanks. Well, thanks, everybody. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to say hello to a few folks before we slip out, but I, I want to tell you all one more time. Please leave here today. I hope, uh, I, I hope you've heard something today that has encouraged you or inspired you or otherwise motivated you to go tell somebody. Because we have 70 days, but I truly do believe that all of us do all that we can to tell the story, the vision that Donald Trump has. And we will make this good man the next president of the United States of America. And we will make this country great again. Thank you very much, and God bless you, Georgia. It's great to be here.